If you played baseball in Little League or even high school or an after-school club and you never hit a home run, you can do it now in an Excel spreadsheet. So the name of this lab is just as corny as that introduction. I call this the numerical home run lab because we will be integrating numerically in Excel or whatever spreadsheet program you prefer. Observe the two trajectories here. The red trajectory could represent the path of a home run hit in the absence of air drag, which has literally never happened. I don't think in the history of baseball has anyone ever hit a baseball in an environment with no air drag because that's too big of a volume that you'd have to suck the air out of. And as far as I know, nobody's ever played baseball on the moon where there's no atmosphere. But this is just how much farther a baseball might go if the ball did not have to contend with air drag. So we will be reproducing this trajectory, which includes the quadratic model of air drag introduced in your book. And we will also be doing a third trajectory trajectory requiring an, an effect that's not discussed in the book. And we'll get to that later. Let's start by taking note of a typical distance, uh, not yet actually, a typical speed for a baseball struck by a baseball bat uh, in a home run hit. Notice they haven't given us any units, but it's fairly clear that we're dealing with miles per hour here. That's the unit of choice for speed in baseball. And you can see that some of them are as low as 101, some are as high as 109. Let's go with 105 or 106 as a good representative ba uh, value for the speed of a baseball in a home run hit. And let's see if we can use our free fall kinematics to, to predict just how far that baseball would go if we didn't have to worry about air drag. So we can revisit what I like to call the range formula. Here's a parabolic trajectory of an object that begins and ends at the same height without air drag. Let's first convert that speed in miles per hour to meters per second. So it, it's a smaller number in meters per second. Obviously it can't be 106 meters per second. That would be over 200 miles per hour. That's too fast for a baseball. At least a baseball struck by a human. If you watch that Smarter Every Day channel, there's a good video of them launching a baseball with a machine, and it goes faster than sound. Here is the so-called range formula, and remember, you can only use this for this special scenario. No air drag, begin and end at the same height. And we've already discussed the fact that the range depends on three things, how fast, how strong the gravity is, and the launch angle. Now, baseballs don't actually achieve their greatest range at 45 degrees. I think typically a home run hit uh, of, that goes out of the park is struck off the bat at an angle less than 45. But for now, let's keep things simple. Let's assume that the angle was 45, and we'll plug in our just calculated speed and the well-known free fall acceleration, and we find that in the absence of air drag, the ball would go 225 meters, which when converted into feet, type equation here, what's that all about, is pretty darn far, 743 feet. I don't even think most baseball diamonds or baseball uh, fields are that long. That's definitely way out of the park. That's probably almost out of the parking lot. <clears throat> so if we go back to these statistics here, and this was taken from an ESPN website that's no longer maintained, but you can look up similar information in a newer site called StatCast. I, I think this is even included in some live broadcasts, but there's a website called StatCast where you can get the speed off the bat, elevation angle, and this number called Apex, which we'll, we will also talk about. Okay, in any case, the actual true distance of this home run hit was only 412 feet. That's almost um, half less than the number we just calculated. So in order to take into uh, account drag, let's incorporate, as I said, the quadratic model of air drag that's presented in your book. Here's the M in F equals MA. We will look at all the forces on this ball. First, let's suppose that the ball is going off in that direction. So the length of the arrow would indicate the speed. There's the ever-present gravitational force straight down towards the center of the Earth and drag force. How do we know that that's the direction of the drag force? Well, 
it's really by definition. The quadratic model for drag that we use assumes that the force vector associated with drag points opposite the velocity. So that there's 180 degrees between drag and velocity. And that's true at any moment in time. So as the ball moves through space, its velocity vector is constantly changing in direction. And that indicates that the drag would also be changing all the time. At any instant, it's always opposite the velocity vector. Here are the magnitudes of those two forces. See over here, I've drawn the arrows to indicate we're talking about vectors. Over here, no arrows. I'm merely talking about the magnitudes of the vectors. So we know how to calculate gravity force. Just take the baseball's mass, multiply by 9.8. As for the drag force, we've got this coefficient that includes three important numbers. And hopefully you've re reviewed this at this point, or learned this, I should say. The drag's going to depend on the air density, which is why baseballs tend to go farther in the Colorado Rockies Stadium, because I think that's in Denver or near Denver. It's high in the mountains. The air is thinner up there. Uh, and as you can see from this formula, that indicates that uh, the ball has to contend with less air drag. It will go farther. And then A is the cross-sectional area of the ball. It's like the area that the ball intercepts, um, as seen by the air through which the ball is rushing. Hope that made sense. And then C is the drag coefficient. We'll get to that. Obviously, drag depends on how fast you're moving. We all know that from riding in a car. If you stick your hand out the car, let's, let's go with a better example. How about a dog uh, poking his head out the passenger window? If that car is going 80 miles an hour, the dog's ears are flapping way more than if you're just cruising at 30 miles an hour. So there's a strong dependence of drag force on speed. This model for drag, uh, the, the magnitude given by this formula and the direction given by the diagram here, that model for drag works very well for, as I like to say, everyday objects moving at everyday speeds. That would include baseballs struck by baseball bats, birds in flight, skydivers falling from a plane, even planes, passenger jets. When you get up to things like the space shuttle, too fast. Same thing with bullets. Bullets travel often faster than sound, and then things get more complicated. So this formula would not be sufficient to model the drag force for a speeding bullet. Also, things that are really small, like a dust particle descending through uh, the air of your bedroom. Uh, those things move slowly, generally, and the drag force on them is really not well described by this model. They're, they're too tiny. So everyday objects, everyday speeds. There's a range of sizes and there's a range of speeds. Baseball is a perfect example for which this formula works pretty well. Okay, what have I done here? This vector that I've introduced points in the same direction as the velocity, which is why I gave it a similar name. See this little caret symbol? It's a lot like I hat or J hat. You would call this vector V hat. What is V hat? It's a unit vector. That's the significance of that symbol. It's a unit vector that points parallel to V. Simple as that. It, it gives you the direction of V, but not necessarily the, the magnitude, because V hat, by definition, is one unit long. This is negative V hat. All I did was flip it around, right? We've talked about the fact that multiplying a vector by negative one just rotates it by 180 degrees. So now we can see that the drag force points in the same direction as negative V hat. So we, we would like to express the drag force as a multiple of negative V hat. Let's just suppose, let's keep it simple, that the, at this moment in time, the magnitude of the drag force on this baseball is 10 newtons, okay? Easy number, 10 newtons. Well, a unit vector, by definition, has a, a length of one. So this drag force could be written as 10 times negative V hat. Remember, when you, when you take a vector and scale it, by multiplying by a scalar, you don't change its direction, you just change its length. So 10 times negative V hat is a vector that points in this direction with a length of 10. That's the, ve uh, the vector that we're looking for. So we can express the drag force as a multiple of negative V hat. Now, how do we turn V into V hat? How do you make a unit vector out of a vector that's not a unit vector? So simple example, let's suppose that this vector A has a magnitude or length, remember this is two different ways, or these are two different ways of writing the magnitude of A. Suppose that magnitude is three, 
So now let's take one-third of the vector a. Scale the vector a by a factor of one-third. What is the magnitude of one-third a? Well, the absolute value, or the, the length, I should say, of one-third a, we can take the one-third and pull it outside of the absolute value signs, or the magnitude signs symbol. Um, we've already established that the magnitude of a is three, so the length of this vector is one-third of three. In other words, it's one. And of course, that's why I chose this vector. You See how that works? And we can call that vector a hat. It points in the same direction as a, but it has a magnitude of one. It's a unit vector parallel to a. So what did I do? Well, three is the magnitude of vector a. So to turn any vector into a unit vector, you just take the vector and divide by its magnitude. Simple as that. In this case, the magnitude was three. So vector a divided by three, that can also be written this way. That is the unit vector a hat, okay? Take a vector, divide by its magnitude. Now you have a parallel unit vector. And the vector that we care about at present is the velocity vector. So how do we get uh, v hat from v? Just take the velocity vector v and divide by its magnitude v, All right? Velocity vector v has an arrow. And if I just say v, well, if I write v, then we're talking about the magnitude. And remember, what's the magnitude of velocity? That's speed. Speed is the length of the velocity vector. Okay, so this is subtle what I just did. I turned these statements, which previously were just statements about the magnitudes of the vector, into an actual vector equality. Watch what happens to the top one. So the gravity force vector is the scalar mass times the uh, free fall acceleration vector. Remember, g is a vector, or it can be thought of as a vector, that points straight down, and it has a length of 9.8. Scale that up by a factor of m, and you've got the gravity force. Down here, I, I am completing the discussion about how to get uh, drag vector d from v hat. So all of this junk in front is a scalar. This is the magnitude of the drag force, and I've multiplied that, that scalar by the unit vector negative v hat. So all I've done is taken negative v hat and scaled it up by the magnitude of the drag force, that quadratic dependence. But v hat, as we just saw, can be written, or I should say negative v hat, can be written like this, because the unit vector v hat is just the full vector v divided by its magnitude. And now let's take the minus sign, plop it out front. Do you see that we've got a, a factor of um, speed to the first power in the denominator and speed squared up top. So we can cancel one of the v's and we're left with this. If I haven't pointed this out already, there's a, an easy way to remember this. Instead of Tupac, this is half Pac, right? It's like Tupac's kid brother that I don't think he actually had. Anyway, maybe that helps you. Half Pac instead of Tupac. That's the coefficient in front of um, the v squared. This looks a little weird because you don't see v squared anymore. You just see v to the first power and then the vector v. Well, remember, this velocity vector v is actually speed times v hat. So there are two factors of speed there. We just rewritten it, and you'll see why. Okay, so now we get to the interesting, interesting stuff. Let's apply Newton's second law. You'll see just how easy this is. Uh, the main dynamical result of the semester is right here. If you could just identify the forces and figure out how to express them, plop them into the equation, and then solve the equation, you can describe how that thing will move. Okay, these are the only forces indicated. This is sort of a free body diagram, except on a free body diagram, typically you wouldn't draw a velocity vector, just the forces. So there are only two that we're considering for now. Here they are, because don't forget, the F in F equals MA is really the net force. It's the sum of all forces. Here's the sum of the two forces. And then I'm just going to switch the sides of the equation there. And now let's evaluate using these expressions down here. So this is just F equals MA for this particular situation, a baseball with drag and gravity acting on it. What's the next step here? What can we do? Yeah, why don't we get acceleration by itself? Because ultimately, what we would like to do is integrate acceleration once to get velocity, and then integrate again to get position. 
because that's what we're interested in. We would like to know how the position of this baseball depends on time. So what I did was divide by m. This m goes away, and then we pick up another factor of m over here. So I've rewritten it like this. We picked up this m in the denominator. And now what I've done is highlight uh, the expression that we would have if we had just disregarded quadratic drag. So in the early part of the semester when we looked at two-dimensional free fall motion, this really was the equation. The acceleration was simply the gravitational acceleration. And that's because the only force we looked at was gravity. But now we've introduced a second force, and as a result, the acceleration has a second term. So this is the acceleration term due to the quadratic model for drag. This first term is merely the free fall acceleration. So the acceleration has now been modified from the free fall acceleration. And over here, I have reminded you that the speed can be expressed using Pythagorean theorem, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of the components, right? Any vector, um, the length of any vector can be calculated by squaring the components, adding them up, and taking the square root. That's really what we're dealing with right here. So I've inserted that, and I chose here to use the, you know, the one-half power notation rather than the square root symbol, because I think that makes it a little easier to look at. And this is looking a little cluttered, right? More complicated than the simpler stuff we did, or that we've done so far with two-dimensional motion. And here I've just highlighted the vector quantities. Everything else in uh, black type is a scalar, right? These are components of a vector. You've squared them. That's not a vector. Those are just, this whole thing is a scalar. But let's not forget that the, the free fall acceleration vector has these components, uh, assuming this coordinate system up here. So if up is positive, then the vertical free fall acceleration is negative g. Remember, in this class, the letter g is always positive 9.8. It's the absolute value of the free fall acceleration. And then the velocity vector, of course, has its two components. And you may be wondering, what about uh, the z component? Well, we're pretending that this baseball keeps its trajectory in a single plane. And even that is not true, because if the baseball has spin, it can actually deflect left or right. We're not going to worry about that for now. We'll just, we'll just assume that the ball moves in a single plane, in which case uh, two components are fine. OK, so what I've done is recognize that this is a vector equation, which is really a compact way of writing two equations. If you go across the, the top row, so to speak, think about all three of these vectors as column vectors. The top row would be the relation between the x components. So the x component of the, the free fall vector is zero. Free fall acceleration is zero. And the x component of the velocity vector is v sub x. So along the x-axis, the gravity vector contributes nothing. But along the y-axis, it does contribute a negative 9.8. Okay, so earlier in the semester, we kept saying there is no acceleration in the x direction because gravity points straight down. And now we're acknowledging that real objects encounter air drag. And for most directions, you know, for most velocities, there is a component of the drag along the x direction. And it tends to slow the object down. Looking a little gnarly here. And let's point out right now that the the x and the y components of the velocity vector show up in the x acceleration. Now, I've been harping on how you should never mix x and y axes when you use f equals ma. Like, if you're solving for the x acceleration, you wouldn't, you wouldn't plug the y component of a force into the equation. That's not really what's happened here, though, because um, this really is right here. This is the x component of the drag force. It just so happens that the drag force depends on the magnitude of the velocity. So even though it's got both components of the velocity, this is still just the x component of the drag force. There's a difference between force vector and velocity vector. And I put a box around this because this is the formula that you'll be referring to when you actually set up your spreadsheet. <clears throat> so let's contrast the two. Here's uh, this much simpler situation of acceleration 
only due to gravity, no drag. This is what we were using in chapter four, for instance, when we did all those um, free fall problems. And now we've made the problem complicated, more complicated, but also more realistic by incorporating the quadratic model of drag. So what's happening here? Yeah, you've seen this before. How do you go from acceleration to velocity? You must integrate with respect to time. So remember that business about change in velocity is the area under the acceleration curve, or in other words, final velocity is initial velocity plus the integral from initial time to final time of the acceleration. Well, for the case of free fall, where there's no acceleration along the x-axis, you're just integrating zero. Of course, the antiderivative of zero is a constant. When you subtract at the upper and lower limits, it goes away. Or you could just say the area under zero is zero. And this just tells us that the x component of the velocity is unchanged for a ball or for a projectile moving only under the influence of gravity. That's the business about the, um, the shadow of a baseball moving at constant speed. Of course, now we know it, it doesn't really. It is going to slow down a little bit, likely, because of the air drag. Integrate once more to get position. Remember, displacement is the area under the velocity curve. Or in other words, final position is initial position plus the integral of velocity between initial and final times. And I've plugged in the particular velocity, v naught x. That's just a constant. So we're integrating a constant. You know what that means. You can pull the constant out in front. And we're integrating dt. That really just means up, or excuse me, that really just means to sum up all the infinitesimal time intervals, which is the total time interval, delta t. Um, of course, delta t is t minus zero, which you can write as t. Okay, this should look familiar. This is one notation for the kinematic equation for position in the special case of zero acceleration. It basically says distance equals velocity times time. What about the y-axis? If there's no air drag, well, then the acceleration is just the free fall acceleration. Let's do the integral again. This time I'm integrating along the y-axis. Change in velocity is the integral of acceleration. Hopefully this looks familiar to you. And let's integrate once more to find out how y depends on t. Remember, change in position is the integral of velocity. But see, here is the velocity. We've already found the velocity is a function of time. You have to integrate the velocity in time. This is how the velocity depends on time. So I've plugged that in here. And when you go to integrate this, you'll find this equation, which, again, should look familiar. This is really the constant acceleration kinematic equation for position specifically the y-coordinate when the acceleration is the free-fall acceleration. Okay, so you've seen that before. I'm showing this to you to remind you how we go from acceleration to velocity to position. We integrate twice with respect to time. So let's try to do that now with our new and improved acceleration. We have to integrate acceleration to get velocity. So final velocity is initial velocity plus the integral of acceleration, along the x direction, of course, between the initial and final times. So if I could just figure out how to integrate this gnarly expression, I would have a function that describes how the velocity depends on time. Now, before we uh, discuss whether that's even possible, um, are these things even knowable? Well, the air density is something you can look up. The, um, the cross-sectional area of a baseball, we can definitely look up. We can make a good estimate for the drag coefficient. We can definitely Google the mass of a baseball. So this is knowable. And as for this, I'll delay comment on that. If we go to the y-axis, we've already seen the expression for the acceleration. Let's integrate that with respect to time. Final velocity is initial plus the integral of the y-acceleration between those two times. And just stare at that for a moment think about what you know from first semester calculus all the techniques of integration or i guess that would be second semester all the techniques of integration you've learned first of all usually in calculus you're integrating f with respect to x and now we're talking about integrating acceleration with respect to time so the first hump to get over is the change in notation but even so you know integration by parts is that going to help you here u substitution trig substitution. I think if you 
uh, stared at this for a while, you would realize that none of those techniques will allow you to integrate this. Because look what's happening here. We're interested in finding the velocity along the x-axis. We want to know what v sub x is. And we want to know what v sub y is, both of which will be determined by an integral. But check it out. Within the integral, in the integrand, appears vx and vy. Same thing down here, vx and vy. So in order to find, it's like saying, in order to find vy at the final time, or at any time, we have to already know what vy was in the interim. In order to know vx at any time, we had to know what vx was in the interim and vy. So it's like we're, we're integrating to find the velocity, but in order to do the integral, we'd have to already know what the velocity was, meaning how the velocity depended on time. Does that hurt your brain? Think, just maybe rewind and listen to that again. How are we supposed to do this integral to find velocity if doing the integral requires already knowing the velocity? Well, there actually is a way out of this. And I'll point out that these are called coupled differential equations. Because uh, differential, because we're really talking about derivatives, Vx is actually the derivative of um, position with respect to time. And those two derivatives depend on each other because uh, dx dt depends on dy dt. dy dt depends on dx dt. We don't really need that for this lab. Okay, moving on. I finally figured out how to shade in the area under a curve in Excel, or not, excuse me, PowerPoint, using um, Microsoft Paint. And I heard they're getting rid of that for the next uh, operating system. I don't know why. Okay. Once again, I will remind you that the velocity, and this is just one dimensional for this discussion. Notice I have not used any subscript X or Y. Let's just deal with one dimensional motion to refresh our memory. The velocity time two is equal to the velocity time one plus the area under the acceleration curve between those two times. Well, what if the two times were close together? So instead of this, let's put T2 much closer to T1. And let's call the time interval between those two times delta T. And the idea is that delta T is kind of a small time interval. And then this, we can make the following statement. Um, it's not real obvious in this graphic, but the acceleration isn't going to change a whole lot over a small time interval. Yeah, it noticeably dips here between T1 and T2, but, you know, be flexible here. Work with me. Suppose the delta T was much smaller. Acceleration doesn't change a whole lot during, you know, like one-tenth of this time interval. So let's just pretend that the acceleration throughout this time interval, that's the height of the curve, is roughly the same as it is at the left endpoint. So this first height here. And that's why I've replaced the acceleration, which is a function of time, with just a single constant, A1. That's the acceleration that the, the particle had at time one. So it's an approximation, hence the approximate equal sign here. But that approximation would become more and more accurate as delta T were made smaller and smaller. What can you do with the constant? You can pull it out in front of the integral sign. And remember, when you integrate dt, you just get delta T, okay? So this equation is an approximation to this exact relationship here. And this should look familiar. But before I point out why it should look familiar, let's look at the graphical interpretation. A1 delta T. Well, A1 is the height of the curve on the left endpoint there. And delta T is the width of this rectangle. So we're really looking at height times width. That's the area of the rectangle, OK? And that kind of makes sense because what we were talking about is the integral of acceleration, which we know graphically is the area under the curve. So we found an, an approximate expression for the area under the curve between T1 and T2. We're just replacing it by a rectangle. And obviously, we've picked up some extra area here. This corner would need to be chopped off. So this approximate, approximation is not great in this picture, not in this particular diagram. But... If we made the rectangle much skinnier, it becomes a better approximation. Now we just have this little extra corner of area. So this would be a pretty good approximation. And yeah, uh, I really should have the squiggle equal sign here because again, it is approximate. But the reason this should look familiar is this is the 
the equation for change in velocity for the specific case of constant acceleration. Remember the constant acceleration kinematic equations that we've been using now for several weeks? This is the one that gives you final velocity in terms of initial velocity and time interval. Shouldn't be surprising because we're pretending that the acceleration is constant over this small time interval. Okay, what happens now if we look not at the area under the A versus T curve, but the area under the V versus T curve? Remember this statement? Displacement is the integral of velocity. Final position is initial pos position plus the integral of velocity between those two times. It's a very similar statement. This is the integral version of V equals dx dt. Velocity is the time derivative of position. Turn that inside out, it says the change in position is the integral of velocity. There's just two ways of stating the same relationship. And yeah, so we've got an area between T1 and T2. Let's suppose, like before, that the time interval is much shorter. And yes, the velocity is obviously increasing between T1 and T2. But if the delta T were real small, velocity wouldn't change by much. So we could make this, this approximation. Even though V is changing in time, let's just replace it by its constant value at time T1. That's just a particular number. And we know that we can take constants and pull them out front. And so you'd have a V1 out front, integrate dt, you get delta t, just like before. And here's a good approximation for the, the position at time two in terms of the position at time one and the amount of time that's passed. Again, this approximation becomes more accurate the shorter your time interval gets. So uh, we're losing this, this large corner of area here by approximating the area as merely a rectangle. So I'm, I'm missing this chunk. But, oh yeah, so I skipped the graphic. You can imagine a, a skinnier rectangle and how that approximation would be even better. But I should point out again, this ought to look familiar. This is the, um, actually it's, I was going to say it's the constant acceleration kinematic equation for position, but it doesn't even have a one half AT squared term. Notice that's even missing. Because if, if you're modeling the velocity as being constant over that short time interval, that's like saying you're not accelerating. So you don't even need the one half AT squared term. Again, this is an approximation, but it becomes more accurate as you make the time interval smaller. And the great thing about computers is that they make calculations very fast. So when we use the spreadsheet, we can make delta T as small as we like, and Excel should be able to do it. So here's the idea. I'll discuss it for the relationship between position and velocity, but a very similar argument would apply to the relationship between velocity and acceleration. Because remember, what we're doing here is taking F equals MA to calculate the acceleration. We know the acceleration of the baseball based on its velocity and its mass and the, the relationship or the, the formula for drag. Once we know the acceleration, uh, we're going to use this process to get the velocity and then we use the same process to get the position. So suppose you know the velocity at time one, right here, you know the velocity at that time. That's the height of this rectangle. All you have to do is multiply that velocity by this, the next time interval, whatever your delta T is, and that gives you your position at time two. So again, provided you know your previous position and your previous velocity, plug those numbers in, you now know where the baseball is along the x-axis at time two. So it's kind of understood. This is the velocity along the x-axis. And then just repeat that. If you have some way of knowing the velocity now at time two, and you've already calculated the, the position at time two, that's what you did up here, then you can use the same formula for the next time interval to find the position at time three. So again, the position at time three depends on the previous position and the previous velocity. And maybe you're thinking, wait a minute, how do we know the previous velocity if we only knew this one when I set up the statement here, or the statement of this problem, well, the idea is you would have already done the same thing with the relationship between acceleration and velocity. Just iterate this procedure. The, the baseball's location along the x-axis at time four is its previous location and its previous velocity times delta t sum it up. That's it. So 
as, as long as you make delta T sufficiently small, this approximation is sufficiently accurate. Now, if the baseball was in flight for an hour, then all these little errors in each approximation will start to accumulate, and at some point, your simulated trajectory is not going to match the real trajectory very well at all. But baseballs are only in the air for a few seconds, and Excel should have enough computing power to, uh, to make delta T small enough that we can faithfully reproduce the trajectory. Okay, so what I skipped here is you could go back to the graph of A versus T and repeat this procedure, but now you would have um, velocity at time two is velocity at, at time one plus acceleration at time one times delta T. So it's the same procedure, but you would be relating the velocity to the previous velocity and the previous acceleration. So if you were wondering, well, where do we get all these velocities from? It's from that procedure. You've, you've done the same thing with V and A. So you can get the velocities. Once you know the velocities, you can get the positions. And again, it might seem like we're cheating somehow. Like how, how do we, um, it's like we're predicting the future. We know what's gonna happen to this baseball. Yeah, we kind of do. That, that's what Newton's second law is all about. If you can describe the forces at any instant, then you can, you can quantify the acceleration. And if you know the acceleration, you can then determine the velocity and the position at a subsequent time. That's what we're doing. Okay, so the program for numerical integration, which is what this is, and I'm not gonna demonstrate this, but if you, um, if you paid a lot of attention to your calculus textbook in first semester, you may have run across, uh, run across something rather called Euler's method. Uh, Euler method for solving a differential equation. That's really what we're doing here, but in different notation because we're talking about V, A, and R position. Okay, so the, the first step here, pick some time T sub I. That's just an arbitrary moment in time, T sub I. Look at all the forces on the baseball at that time, so I've drawn them here, and you can use those forces to find the acceleration. That's easy, you just divide by M, right? F over M is acceleration. Now that you know the acceleration, you can proceed to step two. What's happening here? There we go. Which is this, um, this business of integrating numerically. It's approximating the area under the curves. So V sub I plus one, that is the velocity at time T sub I plus one. We've got two times that are close together, T sub I and T sub I plus one. The velocity at that later time is simply the velocity at the previous time plus the acceleration at the previous time times delta T. In order to do this, this assumes that you know the acceleration at the previous time. We do by using F equals MA. It also assumes that you know the, uh, the velocity at the previous time. So obviously if you keep going back through all these steps, at some point you had to be given the very first velocity. You had to be given the initial velocity. And yes, we will be given that because we just look it up for a particular home run hit. We, we look up the angle that the ball made when it left the bat and its speed and we can find those initial velocity components. Okay, what about finding the position at the later time, t sub i plus one? That's just the earlier position plus the earlier velocity, we assume we, we know, times the time interval. Okay, so use the information you have at t sub i to find velocity and position at t sub i plus one. Now that you know the velocity and position at the next time, you can use that information to find the forces at the next time. And for this particular example with the baseball, um, the position is not even necessary. All you really need to know to calculate the force is the, the new velocity. Remember, the velocities appear in the acceleration equation or in the formula for acceleration. So. Now that we've used the previous data to find the next velocity, we can find the next force and hence the next acceleration. This will make more sense when you see it done in a spreadsheet. And then just repeat, that's it. Okay, at any particular time, look at F equals MA to find the next position and the next velocity. Then you use specifically the next velocity to find the next acceleration using F equals MA and then repeat. Okay, you should probably keep this off to the side when you set up your spreadsheet, which I will demonstrate. 
And now let's clean this up a little bit. This seems like an, an extra complication at first, but it really will make things easier. I don't want to look at all these letters every time. Um, I want to conceptualize the acceleration. Let's just call this whole thing beta. I'm just introducing a letter beta. That's not something you'll see outside this lab. It's not in your book. You won't see it anywhere else. Just for the purposes of this lab, I'm introducing that letter. And it's a good practice to use even in your homework sometimes. It can save you a lot of writing. So it's half pock over M. And you see what I did there? I just replaced all of that junk with beta. So I went from this expression to this cleaner expression. Beta is short for all of this. And this is a lot easier to look at. In fact, these equations are almost identical. Notice that in the x acceleration, we see the x component of velocity. In the y acceleration, we see the y component of velocity. But for both acceleration components, uh, the speed appears in both of them. The only thing that's different is this. And then, of course, in the y direction, we have the additional free fall acceleration. This is what we will be integrating numerically. Okay. If the baseball's got a drag force to the left, which direction is the baseball moving? It would have to be moving this way, right? Well, in order to evaluate beta, we have to talk about the cross-sectional area of the baseball. So I've sliced through the center of the baseball. So if, if you were looking in this direction, your eyeball's over here looking that way, you would see a circle at, uh, you know, through the middle of the ball there. That's the A, or the area of that circle is the A in half pock. And I'm going to use the letter D for the diameter. So diameter is uh, this dimension. So capital D is for drag, lowercase d is for diameter. And we know that the area of a circle is pi r squared, where r is the radius. So this would be the radius. The radius is half of the diameter, so it's pi times d over 2 squared. When you square that, you pick up a factor of 1 fourth. So it might even be worth memorizing that the area of a circle is 1 fourth, pi diameter squared. So let's take this expression for the area. The, that's the area that the baseball presents to the oncoming air. You know, you can imagine that the baseball is not moving. It's really the air rushing past the baseball. And it, the ball is pushing the air out of the way, in a sense, and it's pushing this much surface area out of the way, loosely speaking. Okay, let's plug that in there. So I've replaced the cross-sectional area with the area of the circular cross-section of the ball. And then, of course, that 4 and the 2 can be combined into an 8. And there it is. So when we uh, set up our spreadsheet, we'll have a formula for this quantity beta that depends on all these, these uh, individual quantities. And now we need to talk about the drag coefficient. So in your book's presentation, this capital C coefficient, the drag coefficient, Depends on the, the geometry of the object. So a falling can of refried beans is going to encounter more air drag than a falling sphere, even if their circular cross sections are the same. And that's because you could say that this shape is more aerodynamic. This shape is less aerodynamic, hence it will encounter more air drag. And that's reflected in the fact that the drag coefficient is higher. 0.8 is closer to 1 than is 0.5. Now, your first guess would probably be, um, since we're dealing with a roughly spherical shape, let's just go with 1 half as the drag coefficient. But I did some Googling a few semesters back, and somebody had concluded that for a baseball, which has these uh, the stitches, what do you call those, threads, stitches? Uh, and it's made out of special fabric. That changes things a little bit. And they suggested a drag coefficient of 0.3. And you'll notice they're they're using a slightly different notation, C sub D. It's the same thing. That's, that's your book's capital C. So 0.3 is definitely lower than 0.5. I don't really get that. I would expect it to be higher than it would be for a smooth a sphere. So I don't know what that's all about. But that doesn't concern us here because this is 3A. You're not getting your PhD. Back to the same slide. Okay, and I think now it's time to show you how this is done. So I have my spreadsheet side by side with a web browser so I can look up some of the numbers that we need. And rather than provide you a template this time, I'm going to leave it up to you to, to make your spreadsheet from scratch. Of course, I'm showing you how to do it in the video here. 
here. Okay, the drag coefficient that was suggested, remember, for baseball was 0 0.3. Ball diameter, I have to Google the, the diameter of a baseball. What is Google telling me here? Anywhere between 73 and 75 millimeters. I'll just go with a nice 70, I'm sorry, 76. Let's go with 75. Now that's millimeters, so 75 thousandths of a meter. And since I want to stick with SI units, I'll say 0 0.075, whoops. There we go, 75 thousandths of a meter. Now I've Googled the mass of a baseball. Wikipedia's got some information here. Anywhere between 142 and 149 grams. Again, let's go with an easy number. Remember, a, a gram is a thousandth of a kilogram, which is the SI unit. That's why I like to call it a millikilogram. So it's really 149 thousandths. Can't type today. Thousandths of the SI unit of mass, which is the kilogram. Now, as for the air density, there's a range of possible values. So maybe I can pull up a page here about uh, uh, common air densities. You can pull up a Wikipedia article about the density of air. There's much more information there than you'd like. If you just want to remember it to one sig fig, it's easy. It's the number one. There's basically one kilogram of mass in every cubic meter of air, which might be more than you'd expect. I mean, just look at the room around you. Make a, a one meter by one meter by one meter box with your hands. One kilogram on Earth weighs over two pounds. So there's over two pounds of air in a box that size, which means the weight of all the air in the room you're sitting in is likely greater than your weight. In any case, there is a range of values for the air density. As I mentioned, it's going to be different in Denver, Colorado than it would be in Anaheim, California. But 20 degrees Celsius, that's roughly room temperature. And I guess this is probably at um, sea level. At that temperature, the density of air is something like 1.2. So you're actually, uh, you will be encouraged to tweak this value until you can faithfully reproduce an actual home run hit since you've got the data from StatCast. So for now, I'll, I'll just go with 1.2. You don't need to keep all those digits, totally unnecessary. But I might later change it to 1.1, 1.15. I'm going to twiddle with that value. Now, for the delta T, this is up to you. Remember, the smaller delta T is, the more accurate your numerical integration is. However, if you go with a millionth of a second, then you're going to have a whole lot of rows in your spreadsheet. There's probably a more elegant way to do this in Excel, but I'm not an expert Excel user. Um, also, it's going to take longer for Excel to do the calculations. So let's start with a hundredth of a second. I think we'll find later that even a tenth of a second might be sufficient. Think about it. If the ball's in the air for four seconds and we're computing the velocity and position at um, hundredth of a second intervals, that's 400 calculations. Well, that's 400 rows of calculations that we'll have to do. That's not too bad. We can scroll through 400 rows. rows. Pretty quickly. Okay, now for the speed off the bat, I'm going to have to get that from the StatCast page. I think this was the run that I was using, the particular home run. Uh, you will have picked one from a website. So SOB, that's not son of a gun. That's speed off the bat in miles per hour. And that's given to us here as 105.6. And now I'd like to convert that into the speed in meters per second. So all I have to do is say equals, and then click on the speed that you typed in, and we'll divide that by 2.24. That's, um, that's how many miles per hour are equal to one meter per second. And the nice thing about doing it this way is if you want to change the speed off the bat, once you type it in, it will automatically update. So if I change it to 200, of course, it's going to update in the cell below. And you should do as much of that as possible in a spreadsheet because it really saves you time and it makes it more enjoyable to work with. I mean, it's as enjoyable as a spreadsheet can be to work with. Okay, elevation angle. That's really the initial angle of the velocity vector. And I've got a graphic for that in a moment. And elevation angle is 27.8, that's degrees. We will have to convert that into radians, but I'm gonna do that later in the spreadsheet. 
Okay, beta. All right, I'm going to have to pull up the, uh, the formula, the definition of beta, so we can, uh, in here, we'll write a, a formula that refers to these earlier cells. There it is. So can I do this all at once? Beta is equal to air density. See, rho is the first term, so I will click up here on the number I entered for the air density times. Now, here's how you can enter pi in Excel. You could just type 3.14159 if you want to do a bunch of digits, or just pi and then a set of parentheses. Excel knows that's pi times the square of the diameter of the ball, the diameter I entered right here. So to square that, I'll put caret 2. I hope you can see, yeah, you can see this formula bar up here, times the drag coefficient. So I click on C. Now, I like to avoid nested parentheses as much as possible in Excel. It's hard enough to interpret these formulas without nested parentheses. So rather than doing divide by and then the quantity 8 times n, m, I will divide by 8 and also divide by the mass. I like to do repeated divisions rather than introduce another set of parentheses. It really doesn't matter how you do it. Uh, where is the mass here? Right there. Okay, so I'll check that formula. Density times pi times diameter squared times what's B1 again? That's the drag coefficient over 8 over mass. Looks good. Okay, interesting to note that the, um, the absolute value of beta is 0.0053 now that we've plugged everything in. And you may be wondering, again, why don't I just um, calculate all this off to the side and just enter beta without all this other stuff? It's, we're doing it this way because, let's say you just want to tweak the drag coefficient or just the air density. Like if you decide to do a different run at a different stadium where the air density may have been lower on that day because it was uh, hotter and at a higher ele elevation, you could just go back in and change this number and this would immediately update. Like what if I change the air density to 1.1, then my beta automatically updates. It's miraculous. Excel is amazing, right? This just blows your mind. Okay, Magnus parameter, I will delay that discussion for a further set of instructions. So don't worry about that, but uh, that has to do with the lift on the ball. There's another effect that we have to worry about if we really wanna reproduce a home run hit. So we'll come back to that in another video. Now I think we're ready to get started. And first, let's look at um, this graphic for initial velocity vector. Okay, so the ball has just left the bat with a particular speed. It's going to immediately slow down because of air drag. We can resolve it into components, and we've been calling this angle theta. I guess uh, athletes like to call it the elevation angle. And then the, the length of that initial vector is the speed off the bat, bat, not the bat, speed off the bat. And we know how to convert hypotenuse and angle into components. Remember, we need the initial velocities in order to do this numerical integration. So we, we do have to plug in those initial conditions. Now, I failed to mention that I'm going to put the, the origin at the place where the ball leaves the bat, which is already several feet above home plate. So I'm not, or home, yeah, home plate. So I'm not really worried about um, those extra feet. Let's just keep it simple. So I'll, I will put zero and zero in for the initial coordinates. And my initial time is just zero. That's the moment at which the bat, or the ball, leaves the bat. And here's where I have to use uh, the initial speed and the initial angle of the velocity to get the initial components. Before I do that, maybe I should um, get my column of time. So my next time, remember I called, I called the subsequent times like t sub i, t sub i plus one. Those are just, that's just an index. Those are labels. So the next time is equal to the previous time plus delta t. So I actually click on the cell for delta t. And this is very important. You need to type F4, hit the button F4 after that. See how those dollar signs popped up? You can do the dollar signs yourself. That's called an absolute cell reference. You're telling Excel that um, as it goes to each row to calculate the next time, you always want to refer to that particular cell, delta T, because Excel is always trying to guess when you want to iterate something. 
So unless you do the, the F4, it thinks that when you do the next time, it should refer to the, to the cell below delta T and then the cell below that. So the uh, F4 tells it always refer to this cell when you're adding delta T. So I can hover over the lower right, see how it turns into a black cross. And what did I say, four seconds in the air times a hundredth of a second? Let's go all the way down to like 400 rows, but we're already here at 20, so. Okay, fine, 420, I'll go to 420. All right, so the scrolling is a little annoying. And I can always add more rows later if I need to, depending on how long this ball is in the air. Okay, so my initial x and y velocity components. Well, the x component would be equal to the, it's v naught cos theta, right? We've done this a bunch of times, v naught cos theta. So equals speed off the bat in meters per second times the cosine of, and here's where you need to wrap your angle in the radians function. So I type radians. So it will take an argument in degrees and convert it into radians. So here's where I click on the cell for elevation angle. And I don't need to do an absolute cell reference because this is the only row for which I do it this way. In the next row, we, we use the numerical integration. Close parentheses twice, hit enter. Okay, so there's the initial x component. And later I'll mess with decreasing the number of uh, significant digits available. I don't care about that right now. Let me just check that that is true. Um, you have this memorized, right? What's the sine of 30 degrees? The sine of 30 is one half. So let's check the sine of radians. Because um, in Excel, sine and cosine, those functions are expecting you to put uh, an angle in radians in. So if you want to input an angle in degrees, you must first convert it into radians and then pass it to the sine function. Okay, so it came out as I expected. That means I'm using the function correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. Only difference for the y component is that we use the sine function. So equals initial velocity times the sine of radians and then the angle. Great. There are my two initial components. And that seems a little... No, that's okay. When we add those in quadrature, we should get 47. Okay, here comes the slightly pesky part, the acceleration. So remember... At any moment in time, the acceleration depends on the velocity at that time. Look at the formulas here. The acceleration in the x direction depends on the x and y components of velocity at that same instant. So what I'm going to do is enter that formula. This whole formula right here will be entered with reference to the velocities in the same row because everything in this row happens at that time, excuse me, at that time t0. All right, so equals negative beta. Let me click on the cell for beta, and I hit F4 to make that an absolute cell reference because this formula will be iterated. We will repeat it all the way down. Okay, times the square root. Let's use the square root function. And it's hard to read because it's on the side of the screen. You can read it up here as well. The square root of v sub x squared. Okay, well, the v sub x component is right here. So I click on that cell. I square it. Plus v sub y. I square it. And then I close the parentheses. And lastly, I have to then multiply by v sub x. So times, and I click on v sub x. Notice that the only absolute cell reference is the reference to beta. I always want to refer back to this cell for beta. However, um, let me just go ahead and hit enter here. When I go down to the next row, I now want the formula to refer to the velocities at that time. So the acceleration at time 0.01 seconds depends on the velocities at 0.01 seconds. So I do want Excel to iterate in that sense. Now, are you thinking 10.4? That's greater than 9.8. How could this thing be accelerating at a rate greater than 9.8. It's because of air drag. Not only is, you know, if you, if you hit a ball upwards, gravity will tend to slow it down, but the air drag is also assisting with that effect. So it's no surprise that the magnitude actually comes out greater than 9.8. All 
All right. Same thing for the y component now. This one equals negative g. Now, I could have made a cell for g. I'm not worried about that. I'll just leave it as negative 9.8 minus beta. That's an absolute cell reference. And I'm watching up here now to make sure that I enter the formula correctly. Minus beta, absolute cell reference, times the square root of v sub x squared at that time plus v sub y squared at that time, close parentheses, and then multiply by the, the y component of the velocity. Hit enter. Look at that. The component of acceleration along that axis is even greater. Again, you've got gravity pulling straight down, and there's a component of the drag which also points down. So it, uh, you've got those two, com two influences adding in their effect on the ball. Okay, that's, that's most of the work. What do we do now? Well, I guess I'll have to go back to a previous slide here. Let's find, uh, those are the, this is the formula for how the acceleration depends on, yeah, sorry, it's hard to see here. I'm using these formulas. So let's now calculate the velocity at the next time. I don't want to uh, iterate these cells yet. Let's go to the, to time 0.01 seconds now. So down to the next row. And let's compute the, uh, x velocity at that next time. So the velocity at the next time is the velocity at the previous time plus the previous acceleration times delta t. And since I'm uh, doing this along the x-axis, all of these quantities will now refer to the x-axis. So the next x velocity equals the previous x velocity plus the previous acceleration. See that? Uh, even though I'm in row 21, the velocity and acceleration to which I'm referring are in row 20, those are the previous ones, times the time interval. Here's where I need an absolute cell reference because I don't want Excel looking in the next row for the next calculation. Hit enter. And you can see, look at that, the ball slowed down along the x-axis. Not surprising, that's because of drag. Okay, then the next y velocity is the previous y velocity plus the previous y acceleration times delta t, absolute cell reference, hit enter. Okay. And now look at the second row in this tiny block of formulas here. Let's now compute the later, you know, the, the next position coordinates in terms of the previous position coordinates and the previous velocity. So the x coordinate at the next time equals the previous x coordinate plus the previous x velocity times the time interval, absolute cell reference. So we can see that the ball has scooted to the right by, well, 0.4, that's basically 0.42 meters, is 42 centimeters. So this ball is moving pretty fast. It moves ho horizontally by 42 centimeters in a time of only one hundredth of a second. That's a fast moving ball. The, the next y coordinate equals the previous y coordinate plus the previous y velocity, not previous x velocity, times delta t, absolute cell reference. So I find this gratifying. We're making the computer crunch a bunch of numbers to, to figure out where the ball is going to be every hundredth of a second. And you'll see that it works. Okay, now we can, we can finish iterating. So I think I'm going to maximize my spreadsheet now. Moment of truth. Now, when you first double click to iterate, you may get a bunch of error messages because each column, the numbers in each column depend on the numbers in the other columns. And until you've computed those other columns, there's no values there. So I'm just gonna double click everywhere, see how it looks like the ball is not moving in the X direction. We know that can't be right. Don't sweat it. Those numbers will update shortly. So I'm double clicking now. 
and Excel knows to iterate each of these formulas. So I'll point out here that initial X and Y coordinates and X and Y velocities were computed in a different fashion. I just entered zero manually for the position. And for the velocities, I used um, V naught cos and V naught sine theta. The acceleration starts out immediately with our full formula. Okay. So let's just observe some things here. We expect the acceleration to hover around 9.8. Uh, when, it, when the ball first starts, it's going to slow down rapidly because of air drag. So we would expect a large acceleration. But I'm assuming that after the ball has been in flight for a while and it's slowed down a little bit, that the magnitude of the acceleration show, should go down. And look at that. I am seeing that the Y component of the acceleration is decreasing because the ball is slowing down the whole time. Now, I could include, uh, if I wanted, I could include another column where I compute the speed the Pythagorean sum, or you know, add the velocity components in quadrature. But you can just tell by looking at the components that the ball is definitely slowing down because of air drag. Now, when does it hit the ground? The Y coordinate is going to go up and up and up. See how the Y coordinate's increasing? And at some point, the ball is gonna reach its so-called apex. Still increasing. I hope this isn't making you dizzy. I'm looking for where the Y coordinate stops. There we go. It seems like it maxes out around 18 meters, which is pretty high. Then it comes back down. Eventually, it's gonna hit the ground when it goes to zero. So I could keep scrolling and I find that the ball strikes the ground right around this time, 3.89 seconds. So I, I knew that ahead of time. I've done this, so I knew it was gonna be around four seconds that it's in the air. and. Look at this, the X coordinate at that moment in time, remember this column is the X coordinate, is 115 meters. So off camera here, I'm gonna multiply 115 meters by 3.3 feet per meter. That is 380 feet. Hmm. So according to my uh, trajectory here, the ball only went 380 feet. That's less than the over 400 feet given in StatCast, but at the very least, We've, uh, we've gotten a number much closer to reality. If you just do the, um, the no air drag trajectory, you get a range that's over 700. So we've already um, vastly improved our prediction of how the ball will move. And now it's time to make a plot. Okay, this is a technique you'll, you'll use repeatedly throughout the semester. Let's go with the scatter chart. Now, I don't need to connect the dots because there will be so many dots that it's already gonna look like a connected line. So let me go to scatter chart. No connect the dots. Hey, what is this? I don't want all this garbage. So I'll right click on one of these, select data, and just get rid of all this garbage. No, 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 no. Okay, now I will add a data series. And I'll call this the quadratic drag. I could call it quadratic drag trajectory, but we know it's, a, it's the trajectory. So I'll just leave it like that. Okay. Now, fortunately, what they're calling X values actually are the X values. We do want to plot Y coordinate versus X coordinate so we can get a, a picture of the shape of the trajectory. So I'm going to click and drag over all these X coordinates. And I'll stop when the ball hits the ground. Because I don't want to plot the trajectory the ball would have underneath the ground. That's silly. So this part's a little pesky. There's probably a better way to do this. You could scroll down first and, and figure out what that last cell is and then enter the syntax manually. This is good enough. So I'm in row 409, let me remember that. Okay, and then for the Y values, I hit tab, delete, whatever that junk is. And then here's how I like to do it. I'll start dragging and then I finish by recognizing I still need to end in the same row so I will change this to row 409. Hit tab again, just to be safe. Hit OK. Hit OK again. What? What is that? We should be seeing 400 data points here. So I must have clicked something wrong. Go back to select data, edit. What did I do wrong there? B20 to B409. 
Oh, I see. I don't know why Excel does this. Uh, even though I hit tab, it didn't accept my, my instructions there. So I hit tab again. There we go. Pretty cool, huh? Can you tell that that is not a parabola? It's not quite symmetric. You can see the effect that the quadratic drag is having on the trajectory. So again, this, what was this, like 118 is the range here. That's in meters, I converted to feet, and I got something fairly close to 400. Now, here's something problematic, the apex. I can tell from the graph here that the apex is over 18 meters, but it's not as high as 20. Uh, it's probably under 19. I'll just call it 19. It looks like the ball went as high as 19 meters. Now, in my hand calculator here, 19 times 3.3, that's an apex of basically 63 feet, 63 feet. Let me pause and bring up these, the uh, stat cast figures again, and we'll see what the actual apex was for this home run hit. Here's the run that I was using. I did input uh, the speed off the bat as given here. I used the given elevation angle. Horizontal angle, let's ignore that. Yeah, just totally ignore that for now. Not for now, just... Uh, for the duration of the lap. I don't, I'm not even sure what that is, but we don't need it. And the true distance, remember, I found was 380, I think. But 89 feet, that's pretty far from 63. I just found from the plot in Excel that the apex is 63 feet. That's way off. So that's a little unsatisfying. You could conclude that the quadratic drag really does not do a great job of of predicting, predicting the trajectory of this home run hit. It's a vast improvement over the free fall trajectory, as we'll see in a minute, but it's, it's not great. And that's because we've ignored this other effect, lift, which is often called the Magnus effect. So we'll come back to that. We'll insert one more layer of complication into Newton's second law and do an even better job of predicting the trajectory. But now let's continue and, and plot the free fall trajectory against the quadratic drag trajectory. And for this purpose, we really don't need to integrate numerically. You could, you could go back, uh, repeat the method that we used with quadratic drag, but in the acceleration cells, you could just leave out the, the uh, drag term and integrate numerically, that's fine. But I prefer to just use the kinematic equations. Um, we can calculate the position at any time based on the initial position, the initial velocity, and the time. That's for the x-axis, and for the y-axis, we've got this constant acceleration kinematic equation. So I will actually implement these equations directly in the spreadsheet, rather than integrate numerically. You'll see what I mean. So I'm back in the split screen mode, and I'm gonna try something risky here. Um, the chart is kind of in my way, so let me right-click, move the chart, and I'll put it on a new sheet called chart one. Okay, yeah, that's what I don't like about this. It, it changed the aspect ratio, which I don't appreciate. There's a way to fix that, but do you see how it distorted the shape? Can I undo that? Oh, I can't do it. Let me, let me try this one more time. Move chart, I'll put it back where it was as an object in sheet one. Okay, yeah, that was stressful. Now it's time to uh, produce the coordinates for the, the case of no drag. So I've left PowerPoint up here, and I can just refer to those formulas directly. So the x-coordinate at any time, uh, I guess what I need to do is, yeah, I do need to enter 0, 0 as my initial coordinates, I suppose. Or, no, I don't even need to do that, because think about it. The, uh, the initial coordinates are 0, so... I'm just gonna enter the formula directly here, equals V naught X, that's the very first velocity component, times, not delta T now, so this is an easy place to get confused. This is not a time, this is not the hundredth of a second time interval. That's the, actually, the actual time that's passed since we started the clock. How much time has passed since T equals zero seconds, which would be this time. It's the, the time in the column. I, not a delta t anymore. Yes, it's true that even this t represents a time interval in a sense. We've talked about that throughout the semester, but hopefully this doesn't confuse you. 
okay? And I should be able to iterate that now. So all it's doing, oops, I just realized something. Uh, remember, Excel likes to iterate. So in this cell, the velocity it's using is the one in, in D20. But Excel is going to assume that in the next row, it, I want to refer to the next velocity. But that's not true. Remember, uh, with the free fall, with the free fall assumption, there's no acceleration in the X direction. And you always refer to the initial velocity because the idea is it doesn't change. So I really need to make this an absolute cell reference. Hit F4 for that particular velocity. And now I, I can reiterate. And that did change the numbers. Okay, what about the Y component? Well, again, the initial Y coordinate is zero. So I'll just leave that off. And then put plus V initial Y. So I have to click on the, the cell for the initial Y velocity, make it an absolute cell reference, times T, not delta T, but T, which is this one. And then minus 1 half G. Well, that's 4.9. I have that memorized, right? 9.8 over 2 is 4.9 times T squared, not delta T, the actual time. Come on, Excel. All right, it's giving me trouble. I'm just going to punch my computer in a second. T squared, hit enter. And did I do the absolute cell reference? I did. So I should be able to iterate now. All right, and the proof will be in the pudding. I mean, the plot in this case. And let's do it this way. Let me scroll down and see where this ball hits the ground. And it's probably gonna hit the ground at a different time. You might ask yourself right now, which ball would spend more time in the air, the one that does encounter drag or the one that doesn't? Because on the one hand, drag makes, makes it slow down and yeah, I mean, I assume that the drag ball is going to hit the ball, or hit the ground first. See how the apex here is well past 18 meters. It's all the way up at, well, it's still climbing, 24 meters. So went significantly higher. Aha, I haven't gone far enough. So I actually need to extend the time, let me go back to this column. I only need this, this column to be longer for the free fall case. That ought to be enough. Yeah, you're gonna learn a few things about Excel, I think, in the process of doing this lab. And then I'll just double click. Again, I'm looking for when the ball hits the ground. There we go. Row 468 ought to be good enough, or 469, either one. So this ball was in flight four. If you hit this ball on the moon, well, that would be different gravity, but on the Earth with no atmosphere, half a second later. Interesting. So air drag shaves half a second, roughly, off the time of flight for a typical home run hit. What did I say, 498? Okay, let me pause. Row 468. So I go back up to my chart now. I right click again on just any of the dots, select data. And this time I want to add a data series. And I'll call this free fall, meaning only gravity is influencing the ball. For the X values, let me just click and drag a few of them. And I know that I have to change the row to 468. That's the final row. Hit tab, click and drag a few of these, change that final row to 468, hit tab. Hopefully it accepts everything, hit okay. Nothing. Okay, see it did the same thing. I think it, I don't know why I have to tell Excel twice. Naughty Excel. Select data. Let's edit the free fall. <clears throat> 468. Why does it do that? Come on, Bill Gates. Quit messing around with these power plants and just fix Excel for us. These nuclear power plants. Okay. Looks great. All right. The rest of what we can do here is cosmetic. 
So in the instructions, I asked you to put a few things on the plot because I'm going to check for that. So uh, I'll maximize Excel now and we'll just tweak a few things on the plot here. Okay, every time they update Excel, I have to relearn how to do things, but it's usually pretty user friendly. Either you right click on something or you go to this plus sign. So let's see what we can do with the plus sign. Hmm. Legend. I think we've already got that. Yeah, that's down here. They're telling us which color corresponds to which trajectory. That's fine. Chart title. Do we need that? No. What we do need to do is add a text box onto the plot itself with some important information here. I think right now what I'll do is label the axes. Yes. Okay, so axis titles. There we go. Well, this would be uh, the X coordinate in meters. And this would be the Y coordinate in meters. I just did uh, control A to highlight all that. And there's some things you just can't do in Excel. I would like you to indicate the apex and the, the distance here. You know, actually that's not necessary. I can, I can read it off the plot. But in a box over here, I need you to write down the true distance as you uh, read it off of StatCast and the true apex, and that should be sufficient. Because I'm going to compare your trajectory to the actual ball trajectory. And of course, we don't know every detail of the, the trajectory. We just, we're given the apex and the, the range, or true distance as they call it. And that, that gives you a pretty good sense of what the shape of the trajectory is. Okay, here's how you can add text to the plot. You go up here to insert, click on text box. You get this downward facing arrow. <coughs> Excuse me, I just click and drag. And I guess I'll go with the bold font. You should put the person's name. Uh, I don't know his name, so I'm just making this up. Go ahead and put the stadium. And actually, you could make this the title if you'd like. That might be better to make that in the, as the title. And here you can just put the true distance. And I'm just going to make it up. I think it was something like 420 feet. And the apex was something like 89 feet. But you know what? You should convert it to meters because on the graph, uh, on the axis labels, we've got distances in meters. So I'm going to take 420, divide it by 3.3, and that'll be 127. And then the apex, uh, 89 feet, divided by 3.3. That's 27. So you can just do that by hand. That way I can compare because I can, uh, and I'll, you know what, I'll call this the true apex. So I understand that when you put these numbers in, those are the numbers from ESPN's statistics. And I'll just look here. Well, the, the apex of this trajectory is somewhere around 18, which is way below 27. And that's okay, because that's, what, that's what's expected for the quadratic drag trajectory. But you're going to go back later and incorporate lift and do an even better job. So let me now add a, a title. Chart title. And I guess we could do this with co uh, commas or semi semicolons. What's happening? I'm just making stuff up here. And then you can put the date. So maybe this was on uh, October 15th of 2019. The good old days before the pandemic. All right, and just move stuff around so it's legible. That should be sufficient. Make sure I, I know the units down here on the axis labels. I want to see three trajectories. Later, I'll show you how to do the third one. I'd like to know the true distance and apex of the hit, this hit right here. And then you need a legend. And that's, that looks pretty good. 
Let me scoot this off to the side. And again, here's what's really nice about setting up the spreadsheet in this manner. If I go back over here and try to do a, a better job of matching the trajectory, let's say I want to get that apex a little higher. Well, maybe it was on a day or at a location where the air density was a little lower. Watch what happens if I decrease the air density. You're going to see all of these calculations immediately update, and that means the graph will also immediately update. And that's the beauty of a spreadsheet. 1.1. Let's see what happens. Yeah. See how that uh, trajectory bent up just a little bit? And now it, it doesn't actually reach the ground, so I'd have to go back in and change the final row a little bit. Make, you know, make sure that you're adjusting uh, the, the range of cells that you're plotting. Okay, I think that's all I can say for now. What if I were to change, what, I don't know, what if the ball's mass was a little smaller? Because remember, there's a range of values. I think 146 grams was the lower limit. Is the ball going to go higher in that case? Didn't change by much. So the, the air density is probably the most significant factor. Even that didn't make a huge difference. We will see that the Magnus effect, that lift, will make a big difference because actual home run hits tend to, believe it or not, rise above the expected free fall trajectory. So the range is drastically reduced, but they get that lift that sends them, sends them even higher than they would in free fall. That's the effect of lift, and it happens because the ball is spinning. It's got that back spin. We'll come back and look at that later. Let me make one more change. What if I change the drag coefficient to 0.4? Kind of a big difference, didn't go as far. That's it for now.